Good morning, all. Hope all is having a great day so far. And uh, here we are again. It's another Monday. And uh, hope you had a chance to see uh, yesterday's services. They were great. And uh, topped off with a nice visit from uh, Carol Storm. Uh, she visited and she gave a nice little testimony and memorial to uh, her and Pastor Storm uh, and they, uh, on the anniversary of the uh, finding of the church. So if you get a chance to take a look at it. So let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. You get to look into your word. You find new meaning and find something new and refreshing that we can apply to our lives today. You know, we look forward so much to getting to know you better and to understanding you and to, and to know what you what pleases you. And that we know that uh, it also pleases us. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Well, here we are. I was still in the throne room. Um, and I had uh, I had started on uh, uh, the rapture in Revelation 4.1. This is a picture here uh, that uh, I used last time. That uh, kind of uh, shows the uh, room. And I got a little cursor going to make it a little easier to point to things. We're going to go over a little bit more about this picture. This is a, what it might have looked like. It's a painting by someone uh, Pastor Silcott knows. And some really nice paintings. I, the uh, description uh, is in the uh, box. It's some uh, Bible. The uh, name of the website is BibleGraphics.com. So check them out. Uh, there's some really nice stuff in there. But here you got uh, what it might look like to uh, God uh, on the day of the rapture. And you see that uh, all of us coming up to uh, following Jesus there. Uh, that's for the picture of Jesus, I would assume, right there in the front. And you can see the, the, the uh, trumpet blast over here uh, that we're going to hear. And I think we're actually going to hear our names called, just a guess. <laughs> and what we're going to see a little bit today is you know, we're going to talk about the scroll. Uh, That'll be mostly uh, in chapter five, we talk about the scroll. But you're going to see there's four living creatures, and we're going to talk about them a little bit today. You got the lion, and you got the uh, ox, or the uh, deer in the corner here. And we got the man, and you got the uh, eagle. And believe it or not, these stand for the four attributes of Jesus, and also the uh, four gospels. Uh, the lion uh, for the tribe of Judah. Uh, here depicted uh, in Matthew. And then we got the uh, ox, which would be uh, indicative of the, uh, I think King James used a different word. Let me get to that part real quick. Calf. Uh, yeah, another word for it would be calf. And we got the man, which is what, uh, uh, this would be Mark, uh, and Jesus as a servant. And then uh, as a man, it should be pictured by the man here, and that would be uh, the Gospel of Luke. And then as an eagle, and that would be uh, as Christ's deity, uh, and that would be the Gospel of John. And in front here, you can see the uh, four, uh, the 24 elders, which we're going to do a little review on that. I got, uh, I'm not sure I did a very good job the last time, so I wanted to hit that topic again. So that's basically what we got in this picture, and we're going to go through a little bit of this today. So let's jump into our uh, study here today. Don't need two of me up there. There we go. So here we are in the throne room. And uh, I'm just going to reread uh, verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. I just wanted to readdress this real quick. Uh, but who I see that the elders are. I first want to decide who exactly is in the throne room. And so over in Revelation 7, 11, we'll get there at some point. It kind of tells us all the different people that are in the throne room. And here I'll just read it. And all the angels stood round about the throne. 
So we got angels, and about the elders, and that four beasts, and fell upon, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. So here we got angels, we got elders, and we got four beasts. So those are different. Uh, so some like to try to want to try to say that the elders are are actually angels. Well, this verse kind of tells us that uh, no, the angels are separate from the elders. <clears throat> so I want to point that out. So that's not who. They are. So we know that they're not angels. So who could they be? Because there's a lot of them. And over in uh, Revelation five, we got a little more information about who these uh, these elders are. And the elder uh, was speaking. This is John again. Uh, he's in uh, getting a sneak peek into the throne room in heaven. And he was there in Revelation five. <clears throat> He's going to talk a little bit about what he sees. Keep using my notes here. There you go. So here in 5.5, five, through 5.7 is a, a depiction of Jesus himself. So. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. I uh, brought these verses up to basically say that the other person, the other two people that were represented in the uh, throne room was God himself, along with Jesus as the... Uh, as the uh, Lamb of God. To the Lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into, into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. We'll get later on into the prayers of the saints uh, a little bit further down in our study. Uh, but basically, I believe that they're, they're representative of the saints who are currently in, during the tribulation, are being martyred for changing their mind and, and coming to Christ, realizing that, uh, that they missed the rapture and that they were and with their friends and all the people that told them probably over the years, has said that uh, didn't believe, uh, but now they do believe. But they're going to pay a heavy price for it. So uh, so I guess, uh, so again, I'm going through this particular section because I wanted to uh, explain who the 4 and 20 elders I believe are. So we'll still continue with uh, this Revelation 5.9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And the reason I'm bringing this up here is that uh, the 24 elders, there's some other verses I'm going to mention about who they are. It's funny they picked 24, or better yet, 12 and 12. But who they are, they represent people who are redeemed, to God by every blood out of every kindred and every tongue and people and nation. So it isn't just, you know, one group or another. It includes everybody that was redeemed by the blood of God. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. So again, uh, kind of representing the, the 24 elders again, that they are, they are going to become kings and priests. And that we're going to reign with Christ on earth. So this this is my uh, fear, uh, my uh, indication from my study that the uh, 24 elders represent us, uh, the church. Now I know there's a lot more than 24 of us, and as my little uh, picture depicted that we looked at uh, last time, kind of an idea what the throne room might look like. You can see all those people behind. Uh, those would be a mixture of angels, and uh, that's just a picture. That's, that's true. It's kind of uh, 
another another depiction of what heaven might look like. Uh, the throne room, I should say. But the IBN is that the 24 elders that represent us uh, and other parts that we're going to get to that are going to talk about that the uh, that there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. my notes get back to where I was okay so all the things that uh, take into account uh, we had in 5 8 where it said it uh, whoever the elders are uh, just some other things to point out they fell down and worshiped God so uh, the elders don't represent any kind of uh, any kind of uh, members of heaven uh, at during the years, even though they'd, uh, well, this is indicative of us that we're going to fall down and worship God before the Lamb, and the Lamb we know represents uh, Jesus Christ as the uh, the Lamb that uh, saved us, as John the Baptist pointed out when he got baptized. Uh, Lo, the uh, Lamb of God. In verse nine here. Uh, it talks a little bit about uh, that whoever the elders are, that Jesus Christ died for them, for them, and it uh, was by the blood, uh, shedding of blood, that we got redeemed. And I already mentioned the fact that it's out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, so it doesn't get represent just the Jews, or it doesn't represent just the church, but it represents everybody. So you can basically say that 24 elders is anyone who gets saved by the blood of Christ, uh, both uh, both the church, which is before the rapture, and most likely they represent the uh, those who are going to be saved during the tribulation. I want to point out. I want to talk about that, uh, yeah, and. Uh, by uh, 10 there, talk about the fact that the kings and priests. And uh, we see over in Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So we just point out here that uh, We talk about Jesus Christ now, and had made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are going to become kings and priests also. That's where that term comes from. It's because we're part of the body of Christ that we get that honor. Some other references we see over in Revelation 26. Where again, it mentions... Uh, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such a second death have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign, which means uh, to be a king, with him a thousand years. Again, referencing uh, those redeemed by his blood, or the church, which at this point, at that point, will also include the 144,000 uh, Jews and anyone that gets saved during the tribulation. Also in 1 Peter 2.5, he also has lively stones are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Talking about the priesthood. Yeah, that's what that verse is about. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, a light precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Basically say, uh, again, just review that. It, it talks about the fact that uh, we're going to be we, we're the building blocks of the church, uh, us, as Jesus is the uh, chief cornerstone, and that uh, we're going to be a holy priesthood. That's a door, that's what First Peter uh, he's talking about there. And also in Isaiah he mentions that, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord, and men shall call you the ministers of our God. 
ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and that glory shall ye boast yourself. So again, uh, it's an Old Testament reference to uh, what we will become uh, in the new kingdom uh, and once we get uh, once we get past the tribulation and Jesus sets up for his kingdom, we're going to be ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. Now I want to mention where I think the 24 comes from. And there's a couple of speculations. There's a, there's a mention of a 24 when it comes to David appointing priests. Uh, and uh, in Samuel, I think it was, I couldn't find it. I tried to find it. I couldn't find it. I remember that Pastor Storm mentioned it one time. <clears throat> I tried to find the verse, but I failed at that one. But I did find another verse uh, that I saw in a commentary that I found very interesting. It's in Revelation 21, 12 through 14. And uh, mainly 21, 12 and Revelation 21, 14 mentions two things about the new kingdom, uh, the uh, temple in the new Jerusalem. When it comes down out of heaven after the this is after the thousand year reign but it says and a and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the t names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel so there we get the 12 tribes of the children of israel which represents uh, all the jewish nation and we can see them here in revelation 21 12 are mentioned when it comes to the new jerusalem On the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. So these twelve stand for the uh, what I can see as the twelve tribes of Israel, who are are saved through the uh, tribulation and that are coming into the kingdom and become uh, co-heirs. Uh, we actually become co-heirs because they're actually the chosen nation of uh, Jesus, and that. Uh, I found it interesting that it represents a uh, also a, also a welcoming, and I'm going to uh, so just to uh, talk about this particular uh, twelve gates. That's the same verse again in Isaiah 26:2. It says, open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. So it's kind of indicative of uh, being welcoming in, into the uh, into the kingdom as uh, through through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Kind of represents what the gates are. And also in uh, John 10, 9, it also mentions, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So again, another representation of us going in and out as being saved through the blood of Christ. So we got the gates being uh, indicative of that. And also Ephesians 2.18. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So through Jesus Christ, who represents the door or the gate, uh, we have access to the Father, which is going to be in the temple. Again, this is, this is just some thoughts I had. Uh, you can study it for yourself and uh, get an idea if you believe, if it sounds logical to you. <clears throat> now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So that kind of talks about. So that's the first twelve elders, <clears throat> and it kind of uh, indicative of Israel redeemed, uh, redeemed Israel. But you know, once uh, once the tribulation is over and they're welcomed in, and they uh, and they are also redeemed by the blood of Christ, that uh, that we are all one people at that point. But now, uh, <coughs> now for the other twelve people, twelve elders. I think this represents the church itself, the other 12, based on the fact that uh, in Revelation 21, 14, it says this. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, remember that uh, it's talked about uh, through a lot of the Gospels, 
that Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church and that the uh, apostles laid the uh, foundation of the church in the uh, first century and that we've been building on that uh, foundation ever since. And so it made a lot of sense to me that uh, these other 12 elders, where it's mentioned here in uh, the new uh, Jerusalem when it comes out of heaven, that is 12 foundations uh, kind of indicative of the church. And when Jesus says, upon this, upon this rock, when he was pointing to himself, I will build up my church. And so uh, the 12 apostles, the 12, uh, and that's indicative of the 12 foundations of the apostles who were the beginning of the church. So that's my take on the 24 elders that they uh, represent basically at, sooner or later all redeemed through the blood of Christ. In other words, it's going to be all our fellow heirs in heaven. And it's a uh, representative of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Uh, so, and I know there's other probably theories uh, on what it believes. And, uh, but I kind of like the one I, I kind of studied and found, uh, but you're welcome to, I'd be curious if somebody else has another idea that uh, they think about the 24 elders. But we will continue on into Revelation, uh, back to Revelation 4, 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of light burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, this is, uh, this is a reference of Jesus uh, reflecting back to uh, Revelation 1, 4. We draw into the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So I, I bring that up because in 4 5 here we see those seven lamps before the throne of God, but in Revelation 1 4 we see those seven spirits on earth. Where John, uh, before he, he comes up to heaven in Revelation 4 1, he sees them in the vision of Jesus uh, on earth. So again, another uh, representation of the church. Uh, and so that, because uh, uh, the, uh, that's where we get the term in Second Thessalonians where it talks about the, uh, the Holy Spirit being as the great restrainer right now. He's in uh, the, the Way back in, uh, we'll, we'll get to uh, it, but uh, in Acts, originally where, uh, where basically the Holy Spirit is represented by the seven lamps of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit is indwelling us now here on earth. And we see this, Paul reflects on this in Second Thessalonians 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin revealed. The son of perdition. Now that right there is being held a check because the Holy Spirit is here. Or because the church is still here. Well, Paul, uh, the, again, this is in Paul was talking about the, uh, the the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is stopping all of this right now. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. This is Satan that wants to become uh, the supreme leader of the earth. But right now, the church is what's restraining him. And that's what 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 is saying here. In verse 5, it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So, so Paul's reminding him that this is stuff he talked about when he saw him. Them. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So it's basically saying that he is being withheld right now and he won't be revealed in, uh, in, due, in, in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him who is coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying and wonders. It's talking about the Antichrist who's going to be coming as soon as we're gone. 
with all deceitfulness and unrighteousness in them to perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. It's talking about those left behind. And for this cause, God sent, shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's an interesting term, I believe in the lie. Uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation in the community these days about uh, what the lie is going to be. Uh, and uh, I think the lie is basically going to be that uh, the, uh, the guy who claims to be the savior of the world, which is going to be the Antichrist, is the lie that uh, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So these are the people that are going to be uh, following this uh, false, false uh, leader and that, uh, believe in everything, every word he says. You also see this over in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I just wanted to reflect again on, uh, I forgot to put it in here real quick, that the, uh, the Holy Spirit first came. I had already done this. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire as it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is in Acts where the, uh, the 12 uh, apostles received the Holy Spirit. And, this, and thus the beginning of the church. So Paul already uh, talks about this too in 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are diversity of, uh, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are diverse differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit within, with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another di diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man several as he will. I'm reading this passage mainly because I wanted to, uh, there's some out there that want to try to uh, say that uh, the Holy Spirit, you don't know that he's indwelling us unless you do certain things. But uh, I want you to realize that uh, the Holy Spirit is a lot of different things. So that uh, don't think because you have one particular uh, item that the Holy Spirit has given to you, that it means you're going to have all of them. And that's what this uh, verse uh this passage confirms for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that body being many are one body so also is Christ for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit for the body is not one member but many so I wanted to <laughs> Mention that, and also in uh, mention in uh, in that verse five four, it talks about uh, the lightnings associated, uh, and, they, and they're associated with God. So I just wanted to mention a few verses about lightning, and you see it in the Bible, and uh, it's always indicative of God Himself. So it's all through the Bible. And I just picked a few verses to point it out. Uh, in Exodus nineteen sixteen, if you remember, that uh, this is up on Mount Sinai. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet is that voice of a trumpet again i think that's what we're going to hear a trumpet is not a musical instrument i don't believe i think it's the actual voice of god it's just going to sound like a trumpet <clears throat> exceedingly loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the main tank 
the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Also, over in uh, Psalms, we see it also. The Lord also thundering in the heavens, and in the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coils of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and dis discomfited him. These are all references to God. <clears throat> over in Revelation 8, 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there was voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Again, I'll represent God himself. So under verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Okay, here we get into the beasts. And I'm thinking I'm going to stop for today because we've gone over 30 minutes and that uh, is a good stopping spot. We'll pick this up again tomorrow about the beast and continue with the throne room. And so uh, I will, uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to make these a little shorter only because it seems like I, uh, I get long winded and uh, reflect on this a little bit i know we only got through a couple of verses but there's a lot of stuff going on in this throne room so i want to make sure we hit all the different aspects and uh, so i'll end with a word of prayer dear heavenly father thank you so much for this time to look into your word um, lord we are so excited about that day that we're going to actually see your throne room we just look we just think about it a lot i know i do that uh, what it's going to be like to really be with you and we just looking so forward to that day when we get to witness you in person and that uh, we get to see your throne room and to worship you in jesus precious name i pray amen so i will talk to you again tomorrow and i hope everyone has a great day